everybody and welcome back to Witch Fix. Now, for you guys, it may have been a while since the uh, last episode on the Wicker series, but for me, I recorded that yesterday evening and I'm still mad. So, um, I was not in the best of places, but I thought I'm going to power through. I'm going to keep reading the series. I want to see if this gets resolved in the next book. Uh, so I need to see what's happening. So I dug around in my tree pile to find book 10 in the series, which is called Seeker. And it was only then that alarm bells started to ring for me because there is a picture of a dude on the cover. The book is called Seeker, which is what Hunter is. He's like magic police, a seeker. And um, yeah, so it turns out this book is not from the perspective of everyone's favourite dipshit teenager, Morgan Rowlands. It's from the perspective of Hunter, who is her boyfriend, a seeker, and who at the end of the last book was going to go off and try and make contact with his parents, who he hasn't seen for like 11 years because they vanished right before the rest of their coven was supposedly destroyed. So I wasn't particularly excited to get into this because I don't really rate Hunter as a character. Um, but I have to admit, it was a pleasing change of pace to be away from all the teenage drama, um, you know, who Bree is sleeping with this week and all the rest of it, and to be out of Morgan's head for a while because she's not the most interesting of characters. So what we end up with is a story in which Hunter goes off to Quebec, Canada, uh, to find his father. And he finds his father living in a dirty shack on a bit of like waste ground. He's thin, he looks 20 years older than he should. And he tells him that basically him and his mum were on the run the whole time since they thought the coven was destroyed. The coven wasn't actually destroyed, apparently. Everyone just fucked off and left. And then for 11 years, no one told Hunter or his, like, remaining siblings this. Which seemed a bit stupid and weird, but okay. Um, and it also turns out that Hunter's mother died recently, about two months before where this part of the series is taking place which is a bit of a bummer and quite sad i am also going to trigger one in this episode because we are going to be dealing with some sort of self-harm and suicide related topics so be forewarned the bulk of the story is given over to hunter meeting up with his dad talking to him realizing something is not quite right and that weird stuff is going on finding out that his dad is basically acting as a sort of witch doctor for the local town he's going around doing magic for people uh, and also like healings and stuff and then we get to see hunter deliver a baby which i don't know about you but that really added nothing to the story for me and it was kind of weird like <laughs> because he says that a midwife is there but he's a 19 year old witch and they're just like oh he can help deliver the baby and i'm like well they have a midwife surely she's a professional but okay and sooner or later after that once he's you know washed his dad a bit and made sure he has enough cornflakes in the pantry hunter follows his dad out to the woods one day and discovers that his dad has created something with another incomprehensible celtic name that i can't say but basically it's a big hole in the ground that leads to the underworld and his dad is looking into it every day and doing magic and trying to communicate with hunter's mum which isn't very good and it's taking a toll on him which is why he's not looking his best now the sections at the beginning of the chapters which are a feature of these books and which i've always kind of felt are a little bit more interesting than actually reading what's going on in morgan's life because the characters tend to be like a, a bit more interesting and a bit more evil a bit more decisive in their general characterization makes it more interesting to read the two people that we get in these extracts for this book are morgan who is just at home doing her usual morgan stuff and someone who identifies himself as jc at the beginning but surprise surprise it is not jesus it is a lady called justine whose mum had her powers stripped by seeker and ever since justine has been compiling her life's work which is a list of the true names of things this was a concept that was intro introduced a couple of books back. Um, basically, if you know something's true name, you can command it to do whatever you want, uh, be it a person or a thing. And that sort of reminded me of some stuff from Holly Black's Tithe series, which is um, urban folklore kind of series based on fairy folklore, where if you know someone's true name, you can make them do whatever you want. So I was kind of familiar with that concept. Now... This woman apparently lives near Quebec, which is where Hunter is near. So the council decided to send him to 
Okay, they'll just stop it, basically, because writing down these true names is not a good idea. They could fall into the wrong hands and it's not a good idea for someone to have that much power. So that's sort of the other side of the storyline that we're left with in the book. I actually found that quite interesting because he gets talking to her and she seems kind of a level headed person, even though she is using black magic to talk to people into the underworld to get these true names. But she raises some very valid points about the council, like who, um, if she doesn't like the law in Canada or doesn't agree with it, she can move somewhere else. But because she's a witch, why does that automatically put her in the council's purview? It's something she was born as. She didn't choose it. She can't stop being it. But why does that mean that they get to have authority over her? And she has a valid point because I feel like I said this in my review yesterday that the council seem progressively more and more sketchy the more books of this series that I read. They seem mostly just concerned with having the big players on their side and annihilating everyone who isn't with them, which seems to be also what the evil people are doing. So overall, I felt like this book expanded on some ideas that had been previously brought up, moved the plot along nicely, developed Hunter's character a little bit more. I mean, that isn't to say that I feel any better about him than I did before. I feel like I at least understand him a bit better now. And also introduced some new characters like Justine, who I feel like is going to crop up again. Uh, and some new ideas about who is good and who is evil in this series. What is weird to me is that this is the 10th book in a 15 book series. And suddenly we're in someone else's perspective. It's very strange. Um, Once when I was doing like... Uh, my creative writing degree I decided to make a whole chapter in a novel just from another random character's perspective and they told me that I couldn't do that because it was weird like, I've been alternating between two people and then suddenly there was a third person there and they were like this makes no sense and it's weird to the reader and I think it's even weirder to do it just with a random book from Hunter's perspective but that aside uh, I did have a few minor issues with the book. I say minor, one of them was really annoying. The first issue cropped up around page 30, basically because Hunter is going away for such a long time. Morgan decides now is the time to get her kit off and, you know, go all the way with her boyfriend. What I found weird is that this was from Hunter's perspective. So he's already older than Morgan. He's 19. She's, I feel like she's 17. Um, and suddenly we're in his his head thinking about how like she never wears a bra and he's really into that I'm not even exaggerating that comes up twice and it just felt really creepy and weird and I did not like it like it went from being like teen girl romance to pervy guy mind and I wasn't having it it was weird also I don't know I've complained about this before the font is becoming more and more of an issue with some of these extracts. Morgan's font is kind of okay to read, but the font given to Justine's bits throughout the novel are just very hard to read, uh, to the extent that I was left sort of pondering what some of the words were, um, which isn't good when you're trying to work out who a character is based on what they are saying. So for one thing, it's really hard to tell what the initials are at the end of her statements at the beginning. You can tell the last one's a C. The first one literally looks like a scribble. It could be anything. So I was trying to run down the list of characters who'd been previously introduced, wondering who this person was, if we'd seen them before, if we hadn't, who they might be. And it was quite difficult to work that out. Then later on, um, at the start of chapter six, there's another section. And I had to reread a paragraph about five times because... The way the font looks, one of the words could have been one word or another word. And I was looking at it like, I can't understand what this means. So the paragraph is, today I stayed away from the library. I did not want to be tempted. It would be so easy to hurt or hunt. It, it doesn't really say, like, it doesn't really seem that obvious because it's quite a squiggly, weird font. But then it says, my mother, in my nostalgia and my sadness. But tomorrow I will return to my work. I will continue compiling, continue learning. I cannot think of a better gift that I could give to Mama. And I didn't know, like, obviously I think it might be hurt. 
but it also reads like it could be lust and it's just very odd um and hard to read and then at the end of the book like just when i thought i was getting a grip on the font um there's a bit on page 156 where justine is kind of lusting after hunter and his apparently hot bod and this happens and there's that intriguing scar on his neck almost like a burn except in this font it looks like bum so i had a bit of a giggle about that and it kind of threw me out of things because i was like haha they said bum i never said i was mature but i just read it like that by accident and then i couldn't really get past it aside from those things there isn't really a huge amount to complain about in the book i actually felt like for once it wasn't insanely predictable because obviously we had new characters like justine and daniel who is hunter's dad um showing up who were a bit more complex i think in their motivations and that helped the story to be less predictable one thing that did start to annoy me was how basically hunter's dad is kind of addicted to going to this hole in the ground to try and conjure the spirit of hunter's mum he wants to see her he like can't be talked out of it he's like drawn to that spot uh kind and it's compared to like an addiction at times which i get and he keeps saying that he'll like kill himself to be with hunter's mum which kind of makes sense and kind of doesn't make sense because on the one hand i understand grief and i know that what the book is angling at is that this dark magic is having an effect on his mind and it's like like a drug or something that he now feels like he can't live without but we're told that his wife died two months previously but before that they've been on the run from something trying to kill them for 11 years and also the mum has been like sickening and getting worse and worse and weaker and weaker because of this like dark power that's hunting them so you would think that he would kind of get used to the idea that she was going to die and that they would maybe have discussed it and that she would have being the kind of woman that she's shown to be when they actually do manage to contact her spirit i.e practical and very in tune with what he's like she would have seen this coming and known that he might try something like this and it kind of feels like he was just blindsided by something that was coming for quite a long time and I know that that doesn't necessarily make it less sad, but I feel like he would have had time to get used to the idea. And that just seemed weirdly inconsistent to me. The book actually leaves us in quite an interesting place because Hunter is bringing his dad back to Widow's Vale, which is the town where everything takes place. So we're getting a new character added in. Justine has like sworn her vengeance upon him. So we've got a new antagonist to look out for. And Hunter himself is starting to doubt his commitment to the council, doubting what it means to be a seeker. And it kind of put me in mind of, you know, in Buffy, when Giles was like not being a watcher properly anymore because he was like, the watchers are kind of shady and shit. And I don't really want to be part of that because I actually know what's going on. I know this person. I don't want to just like blindly bureaucracy their entire life because of how things have always been it's giving me those vibes so i feel like he might be rebelling a bit he also finds out that his contact at the council basically like his handler knew that his parents were staying in this hut like knew where they were and knew that it was quite close to what hunter was three months ago which was when they wanted him to like take morgan to new york and go hunting for kieran so they didn't tell him that his parents were there, even though his dad had contacted the council for help because his wife was dying. So Hunter could have like gone to see his mum the first time in 11 years before she died. And the council didn't let that happen because they wanted him to do something else, which is some pretty serious shit. So I'm hoping that that actually gets dealt with in the next book. Things that were conspicuously absent from this book Although we do get a few sections from Morgan's perspective, not that many, thankfully, because she's kind of dull. Um, there is one longer section where she goes skateboarding with her cute lesbian aunts and one of them bashes her head on the ice and is going to die from like an internal brain hemorrhage. But Morgan saves her with magic. And there's still that tension between her and her sister from the previous book. So I kind of liked that we were being kept in the loop on what was going on with Morgan and her life. However, what wasn't tackled was the elephant in the room from the previous book, i.e. Alyssa and her psychic 
murder powers which hasn't been touched on Alyssa doesn't make an appearance in this book she isn't mentioned in any of the Morgan segments Hunter doesn't think about her at all no one seems to be putting this shit together and it's annoying me intensely because I feel like it's quite a large thing to leave hanging and not mention. That being said, we are at least now starting to get to the root of some of the issues that have been brought up basically since the start of the book series, namely the Dark Wave, uh, which has been revealed to be like a horde of demons. Um, we know that it was first used by someone called Rose McEwen, who is written about in a book that Hunter's dad stole from Justine's library. So they have a, a resource on this person who created the evil wave. But Rose McEwen is distantly related to, uh, as in like a couple of generations back, uh, Morgan's biological father and therefore to Morgan herself, which is quite interesting. And the next book in the series seems to be talking about that a bit more because it is called Origins. And the blurb is this. My name is Rose McEwen. The year is 1682. It's a hard time to be a witch, and an even harder time to be a woodbane. But now that I have found my soulmate, I feel almost safe. I would do anything to keep him. Pity the witch who comes between me and my true love. And then the bit that's actually about Morgan at the bottom is, 17-year-old Morgan is finding out about her Wiccan ancestry, but how will this affect her future and her love for Hunter? Now, again, I feel like... The interesting characters and the interesting stories in the series are not those of Morgan and her annoying friends. It's more interesting when we get to go back in time and see these other people, um, their struggles, like that whole book where we got to be in Celine Bell Tower's mind for a bit. That was really cool. The monk who fell in love with um, Morgan's darkest, darkest ancestor on her mother's side uh, and then like died as a result these are some interesting and quite dark and twisted stories the actual framing device of those of like morgan's hectic teenage life is not very appealing to me at all um and i don't know if that's because i'm not a teenager obviously or if it's because that story is genuinely less interesting and a bit treading over old ground like there are lots of stories out there about teenage girls in high school there are less stories about witches in the past and all this sort of dark supernatural mcgubbins so and by the time we're like in the 11th book now with origins coming up it's getting much less interesting to go to circle meetings with morgan and the same old group of people and have them talk about the same old stuff and do wiccan exercises when that's not what the book is about the circle of three series is about wicca as it exists as the religion these books are not about that. They're about all this supernatural stuff going on. So when they go back to this like version of paganism that they are practicing amongst themselves, it is really jarring and also very boring. So I'm hoping we get less of that. I am cautiously optimistic because I feel like Seeker moved us into like a new track with some more interesting story elements coming in. And I can't wait to see if those are continued into origins and then into the final four books in the series because despite quite a lot of the things that i have complained about this series i am genuinely enjoying it as kind of an episodic thrill um they are short they're snappy quite easy to get into and despite myself i am interested in some of the plot threads just not in any of the main characters which is unfortunate i'll grant but Aside from that, really enjoying the series and uh, I hope you're going to stay with me until the end and find out what happens. And I hope it won't leave me in a frothing rage like I was yesterday evening. If you'd like to get in touch or recommend any other books that you'd like me to check out, you can do so on Twitter or by email, which is all listed in the description box. You can also donate to Patreon and check out the Twitter feed for the Amazon wishlist for the podcast. And in the meantime, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye! <laughs>